Hello, my name is Ioana Salmanidis. Welcome to Victorian Opera's web series, 15 Years of New Opera. Across the last five episodes, we've explored various elements that are central to the development of a new work. We've also looked at the value behind creating new opera for young people and communities, and the importance in collaborating with other art forms and industries. In this episode, the final of this web series, we'll take a look at another central component of opera, the music. The musical score ties into every element of an operatic production. It has a symbiotic relationship with the libretto. It influences the decisions an operatic director will make in the rehearsal room, and also inspires the set, costume and lighting designs that complete the world in which the opera is set. Today, I'm joined by composer Simon Brugard and Victorian Opera's artistic director, Richard Mills, who discuss their compositional styles, the role of the libretto in the development of their musical ideas, and where orchestration comes into play. So Richard, can you explain your process when it comes to composing an opera? Where do you begin? Opera begins with the text. It's this magical marriage of text and music. But it's very important that the text is right, the libretto is right. The libretto is like the scaffold. If the scaffold is faulty, the building will not last. So the libretto is incredibly important. And ideally, should be written completely before the composer begins setting. Uh, it may need to be changed on the way, but generally speaking, yeah, the libretto is of paramount importance in shaping the architecture and the content of the opera. So as the composer, do you, how much involvement do you have in the development of the libretto? I think as a composer that uh, I always feel I need to be involved in the formulation of the libretto because I know what I need. Uh, for example, in my most recent project, which is Galileo, my opera for 2023, in which the libretto is, is now complete, I had a very, very hands-on approach. It's interesting that that libretto is in Italian uh, and uses all of the old Italian verse forms. For Butterfly Lovers, I work with Joel Tan, who's a wonderful writer, wonderful Singaporean writer, quite a bit. We met in London a couple of years ago when he was uh, living and working there and went through uh, the text in, in great detail. But before we even did that, we sat down and worked out the dramaturgy uh, of the piece, the scenes, the succession of scenes the number of characters, all of that sort of thing. So the composer needs to be pretty well hands-on, even if the librettist is very experienced. How do you draw your musical ideas from the libretto? Can you explain that process a little bit? The libretto is the source of inspiration for an opera uh, mm -hmm. composer. Then the musical ideas come from that. And the musical ideas come in all kind of shapes and sizes, if you like, a, a wonderful proliferation of ideas and, of course, um, as with anything that's um, uh, rich and interesting, there has to be some editing. Uh, some things have to be pruned out, some things have to be rejected. Some things are full of promise. Sometimes even the simplest things, a motive or a gesture, can become really seminal in the, in the whole work. So it's very hard to put it into abstract terms. Uh, but um, uh, by and large, it's, uh, f I would say that first ideas are very important. They come from heaven. What you do with them, is your own affair and it depends on your level of craft and inspiration that, to some extent that inspires that craft. So you mentioned that you're composing The Butterfly Lovers, which is a new work based on an ancient Chinese love story. Um, and it would, this production is going to be a collaboration with Ivan Heng and Wild Rice Theatre in Singapore. Um, besides your meeting Joel in London, how did the work come about to, to do it with um, Wild Rice Theatre? Well, it's interesting. I've had a long association with Wild Rice, though not on a professional level. I first saw Ivan at, I think, the 98 or 2002 Melbourne Festival, I can't remember, in um, play Emily of Emily Hill. And I, I thought he was a remarkable performer. He captured an audience for a whole evening in the theatre, which itself takes a kind of theatrical genius. And Ivan is one of the great theatre makers of Asia. He's really on the edge. He has a very uneasy relationship with the Singapore authorities, but they love him because uh, he always delivers for them on big things like the Asian Games, for example. Uh, he's a theatre maker of genius. And uh, I thought it would be lovely for us to work with an Asian company 
because I think uh, Australia's future is very much in the Asian region. And um, there are some wonderful artists uh, from Asia and we should be open to them, open our doors and our hearts to them and invite them to work with us. And so that's what happened with Ivan. It took a while to actually um, sort it all out because uh, both companies are on very different trajectories, although they do share the same values, a, a commitment to um, interacting with their, their community, speaking for and with their community, and also a special commitment to young people in their program first stages, which is like our voice program. So we share a lot of the same values. Can you talk about um, what we might expect from the music? Will it have a particular compositional style? Oh, well, the music it will be, um, it'll be Mills, um, uh, so to speak. Uh, it, it does include two Chinese instruments, the pipa, which is a Chinese lute, and the DZ, which are the Chinese flutes, and the player will have a whole selection of them in front of him to choose the one which best fits the, the given moment. Um, and a small ensemble, a string quartet with double bass, uh, a synthesizer, a piano, a harp, two clarinets uh, and percussion. So it's quite a small group, plus the Chinese instruments on stage. Just finally, what point do you start to think about orchestration? Is it at the very beginning of, your, of the composition or does it come later? For such a chamber work as Butterfly Lovers, it's written in full score straight on. And after that's done, we'll extract a piano version for rehearsal. But it, because this is, it's not a big orchestra, it's, it's, it's basically a chamber work with singers. Um, it's written in full score straight off. Somewhere to live in the off season. It's springtime everywhere in every garden that we've seen. It makes me sick! Can you give me a hand? No, I told you. If you want to bring that much stuff, it's your responsibility. Well, I didn't know it was going to take us this long to find somewhere to live now, did I? Can you explain your process when it comes to composing an opera? Where do you begin? Yeah, well, writing an opera is such a, a big thing in a way. Even this, you know, this is a chamber opera, the things that I've worked, so they're not enormous. But they, um, again, they're all, they're all about collaboration. And so it has to start with finding the story and finding someone to write the text with, um, and then really working from that point. And I think if you've got that, if you've got that good working relationship with the librettist, the music really comes out of that point. Um, but with something like The Selfish Giant, for example, it, it started with um, just writing one song. So we wrote um, an aria. And then all of the musical ideas kind of came out of that. And the rest of the piece kind of was derived from that core of the opera. Um, so it starts with sort of small, small chunks, and then it expands from there for me. So with the selfish giant, where did Emma and you get the idea to write an opera for that? What was it about the story that you liked? Well, for the selfish giant, Emma actually approached me um, to write it. It was her idea initially, um, and we were both uh, young artists at the time at Victorian Opera, 
and had worked on a number of youth operas together. And this is a, a program, this youth opera program was quite, um, is really a core part of Victorian opera and something that I found really interesting, the way that, you know, we work with younger performers and um, younger audiences. And so, you know, Emma had read the story, The Selfish Giant, which is quite a well-known story by Oscar Wilde. And we both thought it would just make a really good stage play. And so we just, we went from there and uh, we pitched it to the company. And um, like I said, we, we started by writing a small, a small section and um, developed it from there. But yeah, it came from that, it came from that initial idea of really the, um, how it would be performed with the younger audiences rather than from the story itself mm. in that case. You're currently working on a brand new opera called Cassandra that will form one part of the double bill with Echo and Narcissus that forms part of Victorian opera's uh, season 2021. In fact, as we speak, you're currently at Hordy Hall in the midst of a week of workshops with the librettist Constantine Costi, the director Sam Strong and some of the singers. Can you tell us a little bit about this work? Yeah, so um, like you said, it's a, a double bill. Um, and we were commissioned relatively recently, actually, only a few months ago to start writing this. And it's going to be um, going to be on in less than three months. So it's a bit of a whirlwind of a process putting this, this one together. Um, this one was uh, conceived by VO um, as really something for us to write during the period where we couldn't be performing. Um, so like a lot of things this year, it's... Um, born out of the necessity of lockdown and isolation and all those horrible things that come with 2020. Um, so we wanted to find a story that is, I guess, timeless, something that has a message that appeals to really any time in history. And um, so we went back to Greek myth, um, which... Um, Kevin and Jane, who are writing Echo and Narcissus, also did. Um, and we're just intrigued by the idea of Cassandra, the, the prophet who can always see the future but is doomed never to be believed. And I think everyone can um, relate to that kind, of, that kind of feeling sometimes, particularly now perhaps. Um, but we decided to go more in the direction of a character study of her. Um, so it was sort of... Uh, focusing on perhaps lesser known elements of her story and really rewriting it into a much more um, modern day piece. It's very much, it's contemporary theatre. It's not ancient Greek theatre with music. It's, it's a rewrite of, of her character. How long will this work be? Uh, the total length of each of them is about 40 minutes. So yeah. the two pieces together. Oh. Uh, end up being about an hour, hour and a half. Does that make it harder having to only forty five minutes to tell the whole story? Is it is it easier that way? Yeah, well, there's there's certainly challenges and advantages to writing something that's forty minutes. I mean, forty minutes is still quite a lot of music to write. <laughs> um, it does it does still take quite a long time when you take into account all the orchestration and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, dramatically, it's not a huge amount of time to really tell a story. I mean, I think most movies go for at least an hour and a half and even even most TV episodes, are, you know, these days are close to an hour. So we've tried to create something that's actually just very, very compact and quite a lot happens and we had to really decide what are the key moments in this plot to focus on. And so it was about finding as few ideas as possible, in a way, um, both dramatically and musically. So I tried to compose it from a place of, you know, there's really only maybe three or four base musical ideas that you try and draw everything from and develop out of. Um, so I think compactness is the most important thing in this work. The Selfish Giant and Cassandra are composed for two very different casts, with the former written for young singers. Does writing for a younger cast compared to a cast made up of professional singers impact your compositional decisions? 
Yeah, definitely. It definitely makes a big difference. So, um, I mean, it certainly makes a difference in how you write for the voices. Um, so if you're writing for younger singers, so particularly in The Selfish Giant, the chorus were all um, well, mostly high school age or under 20. Um, so, you you know, you write differently for that. You, know, you do things like maybe not go quite as high for the sopranos or tenors as you might for someone that's more experienced um, or, you know, not have so much all in one go so they've got more of a chance to rest. Um, but in terms of the actual sort of musical composition itself, you know, what kind of musical ideas you come up with, um, that doesn't necessarily change. So I think that young audiences are, um, you know, surprisingly open to more modern sounds and, um, and so you can actually do a whole lot of different things. The Selfish Giant, when I wrote that, I did sort of make a decision early on that it would inhabit a, a fairly sort of tonal, modal world, something that's accessible-ish to, um, to young audiences and not too unfamiliar. Cassandra is um, definitely more modern in its sound. Um, you know, there's more dissonance and all that sort of stuff, but, um, but it always references some form of you. There's always something relatable, I think, in the way that I tried to write. Well, there you have it. Thank you to Simon and Richard for joining me in this episode. The double bill of Echo and Narcissus and Cassandra is now on sale and will be presented on stage at Arts Centre Melbourne from the 17th to the 20th of March next year. The Butterfly Lovers will be performed at Arts Centre Melbourne from November 13 to November 16 with tickets on sale in the second half of 2021. If you've enjoyed the web series and would like to revisit the works we featured and more, Victorian Opera's Coffee Table Book 32 over 15 is now available for download or purchase on our new works webpage at www.victorianopera.com.au. Finally, thanks to you all for joining us for this web series, 15 Years of New Opera. Join us in 2021 as Victorian Opera premieres four new Australian works. Thanks for watching.